dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. Future Funding, applying for an NIHR Advanced Fellowship. In June 2015, I remember sitting in a waiting room in a large hotel in Leeds with four men all dressed in suits, feeling like an imposter. I was waiting to go into an interview for my NIHR Doctoral Research Fellowship application that I'd submitted earlier that year. I couldn't decide whether to leave my cardigan on or take it off, and I felt completely out of my depth. So I gritted my teeth, decided I had nothing to lose, and smiled my way through an interview with a panel of 18 interviewers. A couple of months later, I started my NIHR Doctoral Research Fellowship at UCL. I had four years of part-time NIHR funding, a dream. When I started my PhD, I realised that all the work I'd put into compiling my application, writing in the evenings and at weekends, had not only secured me financially, so paid my pensions, wages, leave, conference fees, all that stuff, but also meant I'd done a whole heap of work already. I knew what my PhD would look like, when things would happen and who would be involved. As I came towards the end of my PhD, it slowly dawned on me that there was to be another period of applying for research funding. I wanted to continue as a researcher, and though clinical work beckoned, I wanted to continue the work I'd begun. I still had data to analyse from my PhD. I just hadn't had time to look at it all. I had new ideas of how to further the work I had begun. So I applied for an NIHR Doctoral Skills Enhancement Award. Now this one is a bit different from the fellowship application. It is a briefer award, a bit like a bridging award. The aim being to enable you to develop yourself, do any training you need and benefit from mentorship in order to prepare for your next application. The DSE or Development Skills Enhancement Award application requires you to explain this story to demonstrate where you're up to and where you're hoping to go. I had to outline my career to get date and the research training that would benefit me in the future. Most importantly, perhaps, I had to ask my employer, the Higher Education Institute where I work, to demonstrate their support for me by matching the award. The whole thing caught me off guard when I applied and was actually awarded the funding. Now I'm nine months into my DSC or Development Skills Enhancement Award and I've just submitted an application for an NIHR Advanced Fellowship. This is the next step on the ladder of the NIHR Research Career Pathway for me. It will be the third application, and if successful, this would secure another five years of funding for me and my research. It would allow me to continue working on my research with the collaborators and mentors that I've chosen. A fellowship feels like a really concrete way of progressing my career. In the interim, I've been successful in applying for other smaller amounts of money through Alzheimer's Research UK and the UCL Grand Challenges. Neither of these were anywhere near the amount of money I'd asked for in my NIHR applications, but they are also nowhere near as much work to do. Perhaps it's a good thing to have started my academic career with my NIHR DRF application, that Doctoral Research Fellowship. Alongside my recent advanced fellowship application, these have felt the hardest. And by the hardest, I mean both physically and emotionally. I guess this meant I haven't been surprised about how much hard work has it's all involved the second time round. A colleague who was himself applying for an NIHR grant casually advised me that one must remain relatively sanguine when making an NIHR application. Kind of agree, but I also don't agree. I found that I have had to invest my whole entire self in the writing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got it it done. I wouldn't have persevered through the negotiations with the NHS, sorry, the NHS uh, finance person who costed my NHS costs and the two university finance departments at both universities involved in my application. I wouldn't have asked for so much feedback and forced myself to be so thorough if I didn't really, really, really care. I think I needed to be incredibly invested 
to get the 55 page application done and submitted. I needed to really, really want it. Just submitting it feels like a huge milestone. And now, with a couple of weeks distance between the submission process and this blog, I have become a bit more philosophical. If I get an interview, that would be wonderful. But if not, I'll try again or I'll try somewhere else. So for all those people who are considering this route, be prepared to care in order to get it done. And here are a few more tips and hints that I have found to be helpful. First of all, find other people, not dissimilar to yourself, who've got this fellowship. Ask them for advice. Meet them if you can, well in advance of starting your own application. They might even share their application with you. If they do, that is a massive bonus. You want to see what a recent successful application looks like. Now, you've probably got used to writing yourself up, but make sure you have what they want. They will look at you as a candidate. Tell them that you have enough publications. Tell them how well connected you are. Tell them that you can influence practice and policy. Tell them about all your future destiny as a national or international leader. There is a section that asks you to enter any awards you've received. There's a separate section for grants, mind. So in this section about the awards, you can also enter academic distinctions, such as super special invited talks. There's no other spot for talks, so this seems really quite handy to do it here. Try to get your university to contribute some finances towards your cause and then showcase it in the application. For example, paying for a PhD student for you. If your uni feel you're a good investment, it means they are more likely to support you post-award too. And the NIHR, alongside a number of other funders, have recently criticised universities for not supporting people beyond their awards. This will show you are supported. Talk to your potential mentors and existing mentors. Talk to anyone who will listen, but preferably people with some knowledge of the areas you are both more and less confident about for your project plan. I recommend doing this both before you get your ideas on paper as well as during the writing phase. Get in touch with the research design service. They can offer a different viewpoint and have insight to what the NIHR like. Now, when you do this, send them your entire application, the draft version, not just the research project bit. This was a mistake I made. They can advise you on the entire thing. Link your work to current NIHR priorities and state that your work links to these things. Use the NIHR language to do this within your application. Address EDI and underserved populations. State how you have included them and how this aligns with NIHR priorities on including these groups. And if not, why not? Do not forget about your PPI plan. It is much more important than many people think it is. Make sure you account for that work in your finances too. Basically, PPI will happen throughout your project and you should need to ensure it is not tokenistic. Think about your training plans very carefully. Talk to your mentors and do an assessment of your current needs. Then say you have done this in your application and explain how your training plan fits with the project. Use the tools that you have available to make your writing clear. Use underlining, bullet points, italics and bold fonts. It will help the reviewers pick out the important bits. Chase your mentors and all those people who need to sign things off. Make sure it happens. Do not hesitate to bother them. And once it's all submitted, start peddling back emotionally to that sanguine state. Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.